Well, we're glad you're with us today on The Perspective. As you probably know by now, my name is Mike Sherboneau, and we seem to talk about all sorts of subjects and issues that are relevant in the news, and I hope relevant in your life as well. And today is going to be no exception. If we're trying to unpack the anti-Semitic mindset that seems to be so prevalent once again, and if you're wondering how did that ugly monster raise its head, well, we're going to look at it, but from a little different angle today. I am delighted to have uh, the author of a new book that's called Irina's Gift. Karen Kirsten is with us. She lives in Boston, but has uh, spent some time in Toronto as well. So that makes her half Canadian at that point. But she has written a powerful story uh, of how what happened in the Holocaust has actually impacted her own life. And we're going to bring her in right now. Karen, thank you for being with us today. So glad to have you a part of the program. Mike, it's just absolutely a pleasure to be here. And I know that the book that you have written, you want it to be an instrument of peace. And uh, how timely for this book to be given uh, and to be written. But start with the simple question, why is it called Irina's Gift? It's about um, my biological grandmother, Irina, who I knew nothing about um, because when my mother was in her 30s and I was nine years old, she received a letter from Toronto from this stranger who told her that during World War II, as a toddler, she had been rescued by a notorious SS officer and that her mother, Irina, was murdered. And if that wasn't enough to give my mother a heart attack, the letter also uh, said that the people who raised her that she thought were her parents were actually her aunt and uncle. And she kept all of that secret from me. And when I was a teenager, I found out that the grandparents I adored weren't my biological grandparents and that I had this grandfather in Canada. Well, you know, just we're not even talking about the book, but all the trauma that you just described in 30 seconds or less uh, kind of leaves my head spinning. So take me from hearing that. How did you process all of those things to jumping ahead many years later to writing the book? I don't think I processed them uh, well at the time. It was, I was 13 years old and I remember my reaction, my physical reaction. It was this bizarre reaction of laughing and crying and hiccuping at the same time. And I know now that that's shock. Um, and it seemed novel that I had this grandfather on the other side of the world who I'd actually met. Um, there, you know, there were all these secrets and, and lies in our family. And after my mother received the letter, we actually flew to Toronto to meet this long lost relative that my mother described. And so when we found out the truth, I knew who my grandmother was, but I wasn't my grandfather, my biological grandfather was, he was named Dick in Canada, Dick Shigoda. And I didn't, wasn't really interested in Irina. She was, she was a ghost, whereas Dick was real, someone who I'd met. So, you know, when I, I actually went to live with him during my gap year. And so you asked how the book came about. He, um, I was 18 years old and at night he would tell me, he would have a drink and he would start telling me these stories about how he had been an engineer during the war, uh, during, before the war, how he was a captain in the army, how he defended Warsaw. And then he started telling me about the concentration camps. And at the time, I was too young to know what to do with all these horrible stories, but I knew more about Dick Shigoda than my, than my mother did. So I had this sort of, as I got older, I had this sense of responsibility that I needed to do something with these stories. So when you met Dick, your biological grandfather, your mother, was she still alive at that point? I first met him when I was 10 years old, but I didn't know he was uh, my grandfather. I, we were told to call him Uncle Dick. You know, my mother um, my mother brought me up not to tell lies, but <laughs> they, told, they told some whoppers. 
when I was, uh, what my, the people I thought were my grandparents, Alicia and Mietek, um, when I was four, I remember asking about the, the numbers on my grandmother's arm and she told me they were her phone number and that she'd had them tattooed there, especially so she'd never forget it. So there were, everybody was hiding all these secrets behind these walls of silence. So in Canada, we were told to call Dick an uncle and we were told to call his mother, who was in her 90s, who had also survived the war, to call her babcha, which in Polish means grandmother. So even though my mother really believed in not telling lies, I guess we all tell, um, we all keep secrets from our children to protect them. We all tell lies in a way to protect people that we love. This man, Dick, your biological grandfather, really was, um, went through an incredible ordeal. Give us a couple of the highlights about what all he encountered. Well, after his his um, wife was murdered, they were hiding in a house outside of Warsaw, and uh, he, she was murdered in front of my mother, and she survived. And so he um, joined the underground. He wanted the Polish underground. He wanted to avenge her death and and fight for Poland. But no one wanted to take care of my mother. She looked like me. She had chocolate eyes, jet black hair, very dangerous looking child. So he, um, my, my, the woman who I grew up thinking was my grandmother, Alicia, Irina's sister, offered to take her. And she was zigzagging all over Poland on false papers trying to outfox the Nazis. So while Dick was working for the underground, um, he... She looked after my mother, and then they were all arrested and taken to this notorious prison in central Poland that was attached to Gestapo headquarters for um, ta a task with destroying the Polish resistance. And Dick was interrogated and, and tortured there, and of 500 people who were tortured in that basement there, only 10 survived. And Dick was the only Jewish one. And from there, they were sent to various um, concentration camps. Dick went to from Auschwitz to Dachau, and he ended up, um, well, he actually wasn't there during the liberation. He was sent on a death march and ended up in Garmisch Partenkirchen after the war, which is um, in the German in the German Alps. But then that was, the, yeah, that was a lot. <laughs> so before we go to the break, I want you to take us back now. You give, you've whetted our appetite. Uh, I want to read the book. I want to find out more, um, especially how families shift and change uh, with your mother and the people that were close to you who spun all these lies was there a period of time when you wondered who you could actually believe? How did you how did you come to terms with all of that? That's a really good question. I always suspected my Australian grandparents. I grew up in Australia. Um, Alicia and Mietek were hiding things that they would um, they would shut down my questions just as they shut down my mother's questions when. She remembered things about the war that they didn't remember. So there was always this weird, this weird environment in our family. So I guess that's what turned me into a curious person. And that's why I was the, the sibling to write this book, because I didn't believe things at face value. I, I, if, if they answered a question, I don't, uh, if they answer my question in a weird way, I'd ask a question in another way. And maybe that's why Dick, um, I was closest to Dick because he knew even though I was 18, that later I'd be more interested in his history. And my um, Alicia, my, my Australian grandmother, trusted me with her story too. After Schindler's List, she asked me to take her to the movie. And then it was a week later, she told me for the first time about Auschwitz. She wow. never told anybody else about Auschwitz. And I was able to, eventually she let me interview her 
And on the last day, she told me that what happened, to, she worried that what happened to her would happen again. And that's when I promised her that I would tell her story. So I knew hers and I knew Dick's. And that was a, an awful weight of responsibility. You know, we're going to pause right at that moment, but when she told you that what had happened to her would happen again, I'm reminded of where I lived in Toronto, uh, just off of Bayview Avenue, and I would drive by the Jewish synagogue, which interestingly was next to the uh, the Muslim mosque. And mm. But there's a sign there, a sign that says, never again, never again. Mm. And mm-hmm. you've talked about the motivation for you writing. We're going to come back in just a moment and hear more about this fascinating story. Uh, today, our guest is Karen Kirsten, who has written Irina's Gift, and it's coming out this summer. You're watching The Perspective, and at any time, if you would like prayer, I'd love for you to call us at 855-910-6297. People are here to pray with you, to encourage you, so that we don't get entrapped in the bitterness that we see so prevalent in the world today. I'm going to be right back in just a moment. My name is Alan Gallant, the Executive Director of Agora Network Ministry. My wife and I had the privilege of writing a book called The Beautiful Strokes of God. This book is to encourage anyone that has gone through in the local church a mental health crisis. So if you're needing to read some good material on mental health and healing and the church, reach out to Agora Network Ministries and we can provide this book for you. Welcome back to The Perspective. My special guest today is Karen Kirstens, who has written a book that's coming out very soon, Irina's Gift. And uh, Karen, this is going to be available in bookstores everywhere. Uh, Is there an early printing? Uh, What day can we expect to see it hit the uh, bookshelves? You can pre-order it now through your favorite bookshop or on Amazon, but it's coming out in Canada on July the 23rd. Okay, looking so forward to that. Uh, Just while we're on the break, you told me a little bit about your biological grandfather, whose name was Dick, survived to Auschwitz and Dachau. And interestingly, he had to make shoes for what organization? Tell us that story. Well, remember that prison I told you about? Well, after their interrogations, they would be taken back to their prison cells And he sewed, he and the other prisoners in his cell, I think there were 16 of them, they had to sew shoes for barter. And then I learned later while I was researching the book that he actually designed a factory in in Canada for barter. And I think that speaks to what a lot of refugees and war survivors have to do. They have to put their pasts behind them and start again. They have to learn how to live in a civilized society with people who are kind to them and they have to um they have to do things that are are oftentimes very difficult for them i don't know why he accepted that commission maybe it was intentional for for some people um like my mother for example she bought a pair of shoes uh, barter shoes because that was her way of saying, you know, Hitler lost. Um, we are going to take back all the things that we weren't allowed to allowed to do. And so maybe Powerful. Dick did that too. Well, and your grandfather uh, was a brilliant architect. I have a list here. He designed the McMichael Gallery in Kleinberg, uh, Maple Leaf Mills Limited, as you said, a bad shoe factory, the Monasterium of Caesarian Monks in Mono Mills, and over 40 Toronto uh, area schools, mind-boggling. But that's not the whole story. And what I'd love for you to do is let's start the interview all over again for people just jumping in. I want in two or three minutes for you to condense the story 
into a nutshell, and then I got to ask you some questions related to that. So just spin the whole story from one end to the other. It's really about messy, complicated families and the the lies we tell and the secrets we keep from people we love to protect ourselves and to protect them. It, it's about this secret family that that I knew nothing about, that my mother discovered when she was uh, 32 years old, that she she knew she had survived the Holocaust in Poland, but she discovered when she was 32 that she had this father in Canada that she knew nothing about. And it's also about, um, it's also, it's a very positive, uplifting story. The most important thing in this book is that there were people who risked their lives to save my mother and her family. And their empathy and kindness, the kind of empathy and kindness that we need to see more of in our world today is what saved my mother's life. Wow. Powerful story. And as the book is getting ready to come out right now, what is going through your mind as you are observing what's been taking place in the Middle East right now? What are some of your feelings? I think it's there was a lot of anti-Jewish hate before um, October 7th, but I am surprised at the effect uh, it's had on the rise of anti-Jewish hate around the world. I'm glad that my my grandmother and my mother aren't alive anymore to see it. It's a very complicated um, situation. And it, when to write Irina's gift, I had to study the effects of war on children like my mother. And I think the key to de-escalating hate and violence today in the Middle East and around the world is to see all innocent people as someone's mother, someone's father, son, or daughter or sister, people who need our compassion and help. And if we mm. and leaders focus on that and think of people as we would our own families, we're more likely to come up with creative solutions to very complicated problems. You know, the Polish man who helped smuggle my mother out of the ghetto, the Warsaw ghetto, and the Catholic sisters who later hid my mother didn't necessarily see my mother as a Jewish child. They saw a hungry child. They saw a sick child. They saw a little girl who was crying for her dead mother. And that they felt empathy for that child. And that kind of empathy has the power to save lives. It saved my mother's life. Well, as you talk about that, the um, the whole motif of scripture is the power of Christ's love to change loves to change lives, and that love can invade uh, even the darkest situation. Uh, as you did your research, tell us at least one story, and I know I'm putting you on the spot of of a completely dark situation where somebody chose to be different. I mean, you talked about the nuns who uh, risked their lives to protect your mother. Um, were there other stories that stood out to you as well? One man in particular, he was a, a Catholic Pole named uh, Roman Talakovsky, and he was a friend of Irina, my biological um, grandmother's father. And when the Nazis banned bank accounts for Jews and sealed them off inside the Warsaw ghetto behind a 10 foot high wall. He gave all, uh, my, my great grandfather gave all his money to his wealthy friends and a little bit to Roman Talakovsky. And even though there were phones working in the ghetto and the mail was working, he never heard from his wealthy friends again. But Roman somehow found a way to smuggle a little bit of money and food into the ghetto and he kept my mother and her family alive and then he was he also helped get them out of the ghetto and found them a place to hide outside of warsaw and this was at a time when the risk of helping a jewish person was uh the penalty of death so i wouldn't be here if a roman hadn't risked his life to save my mother yeah karen when you were writing the book what was going through your mind to say, I will know the book's been successful if? 
What were you hoping? What are you hoping that it's going to accomplish? I will know the book is successful if people read it and and this is happening now because it was published in the UK and Australia and New Zealand. People write to me and say, wow, you changed my whole perspective, A, on what it means to be Jewish. My mother was actually, uh, she raised me Christian and my grandparents were atheist. Um, you've changed my mind about what it means to be Jewish, but you've also shown me the power of, um, in the middle of chaos, the power of actually standing up and doing the right thing. Of that empathy and kindness they write to me about all the time. So if people read this book and it changes their mind about how they might talk to their neighbors in this divided world, then it's been a success. And my grandmother would be um, happy. I just want to thank you for taking the time to come on the program. You've been listening to Karen Kirsten, and she's written a book that is coming out in Canada here this July. It's called Irina's Gift. I encourage you to pre-order it right now through Amazon or one of your local bookstores. And Karen, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to come. We've enjoy- I've just personally enjoyed the conversation so much. Me too. Thank you so much, Mike. And we'll look forward to chatting again. Folks, you're listening to The Perspective. My name is Mike Sherbino. I'm going to be right back in just a moment. Hi, my name is Ryan Walter, and I played a long time in the National Hockey League. Uh, So long ago, I played against the Philadelphia Flyers back in the day when they were the Broad Street Bullies. Uh, Let's talk about fear. (laughs) We, We had some fear. You couldn't be alive and not be afraid in that situation. But you know what's interesting is Napoleon says there's two great levers to move men, fear and interest. But you know what Jesus says? This is crazy. He says, fear not, right? 365 times in the Bible, apparently, it says, fear not. So this week, let's not fear. Let's believe in Jesus. How do we learn to live? You ever been asked that question? Probably not, but yet we struggle with it every day. I mean, how do I process my feelings? How do I process what drives me? What is my hidden agenda? And maybe as someone said, if you have yourself for a doctor, you have a fool for a patient. If we try to psychoanalyze ourselves and if we were to pause and ask ourselves the question, what are the key tenements of our life? What would you say? Well, the Apostle Paul has that answer. And maybe it's good for us just to dive deep right now, especially in light of what Karen has been sharing with us about the multitude of lies as different secrets, family secrets were kept away from her and from one another. And yet when the truth comes out, it is very freeing in itself. Paul would write in Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Now, if God's peace is to rule in my heart, then I need to learn from Jesus himself because there's so much happening all around that we can't control, but we desperately often uh, want to think that we're in control, that we can handle it. Do you remember Jesus on the night when he went to the cross? He said, Lord, if you are willing, take this cup from me. And the cup was the prospect of the cross. Then he adds, but not my will, yours be done. And when I learn to live that way and say, God, not my will, yours be done, his peace becomes a reality. Even as you deal with sickness, even as you deal with trauma, even as you're dealing with war. That's why the writer to the Hebrews says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him in the cross, he scorned its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And we need to consider him. We need to think about him. So here's how we are to live. You know, there's a lot of books that tell us how to live. The problem is we just don't follow them. And think about this new book that's coming out, Irina's Gift. Will you read it 
And then secondly, will you absorb the principles that are in it so that you and I can live better? We think of Jesus and the example that he gave to us when he said, Lord, if you're willing, take this cup from me. I think that we have to remember that there is a process that we need to go through daily. Um, I call it the five-step process if I'm to live in peace. I say, what is the five-step process? Well, let me help you with this. First question is this, who is my ruler? Who is my ruler? It says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. See, if I'm the ruler, then I'm going to be trying to hold it all together all the time. But if Christ is my ruler, I can say, Jesus, I am being surrendered, surrendered to you. Now, the second question is linked to the first. The first one is, who is my ruler? But secondly, what is my calling? And Paul writes here in Colossians 3, he said, I am called to peace. If you and I are in distress, then that is not where God wants you to be. I'm not saying that you need to ignore the situation that you're in, but it was like Moses when he was facing the Red Sea with the nation of Israel behind him and the Egyptians coming to annihilate them. And he's starting to panic and God says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. For the Lord your God will fight for you. You only need to be still. So who is my ruler and who is what is my calling? But here's another question that I need to ask. How can I be thankful? See, being thankful is not laughing at tragedy. It's not laughing at hardship, but it's understanding the truth of God's word and letting it impact our life right here and right now. And that's what Paul would write here. He says, let the peace of Christ, uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So if it's dwelling in me, what is my behavior like? Am I thankful? And that's why I need to think about where is God's word? Let his word dwell richly in my life so that my behavior shows that I'm being governed by the word of God. So that means that I face a crisis and even when I finish the recording today, I've got to deal with a gentleman who's dealing with a life-threatening situation. What's going to be my resource? It is the word of God. And that's going to change my life. People, you can't do life on your own strength and survive. You need Jesus. And he's waiting for you to invite him to be the leader and Lord of your life, to walk with you through the ups, the downs, the heavens and the hells of this life. He wants to be your friend. He wants to be your presence. But he's waiting for you to say, Lord, will you come today and be my savior? And if you're praying that simple prayer, write to me, prayer at the perspective.tv or call the number that's there below on your screen. Thanks for watching The Perspective.